Welcome to The Porch. I'm Lindsay Bocardo, virtual and a keynote speaker for organizations who want to build strong, emotionally intelligent, and psychologically safe teams. I personally believe that the modern day leader has an obligation to continue to grow and lead others from a healthy and healed place. So we bring on all types of leaders, psychologists, storytellers, emotionally intelligent researchers, anyone that will help you and I grow as leaders. This is where I bring my favorite thought leaders. And today we have the one and only Jess Ekstrom. And she's going to talk about her booming speaking business, her passion to help each one of you find and share your story. If you haven't met Jess yet, she is a Forbes top rated speaker, two time best selling author. You can grab her books on Amazon. She's a social entrepreneur and she's on a mission to help women like you and me become confident speakers. You may know some of her fans, some of the people in her world, just this guy named Chip Gaines. I don't know. Is he? I don't know. Who's Chip Gaines? Just kidding. He even said himself, Jess Ekstrom is leaving her mark on this world. And it's amazing to watch her do it. You've got the co-founder of Netflix commenting on Jess's work. She's very poised and polished as a speaker, confident, funny, great connection with the audience and leaving them inspired. Ariana Huffington put her on her 99 female disruptors list. And maybe my favorite fact about Jess is that she just became a new mom to a little girl. And now she's thinking about moms in the workplace and how to advocate for us. So Jess, it's an honor to have you on the porch. We had so many questions pile in. I spent my morning organizing them and getting ready for this combo. So thanks for taking the time. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. I feel like you're someone who, even though we just met, I mean, it, it's been months now. I feel yeah. like it's been years. You're just an amazing person and like true, true example of allyship. Like there's a lot of people that you meet and it's like, yeah, I'd love to work with you. I'd love to help out. And you do it. You walk the walk. So I'm so happy to be here. That's what we're doing. You know, when you and I, you know, something we're aligned on a lot of things, but one thing is getting more women on stages. That is critical. And I know that I've had men and women reach out and say like, Jess, tell me more, tell me more. But I got to tell you, we had three types of questions come in. One about how do I be this thing called a speaker presenter? What are the skills I need? We had some people say, I do want to be on stages, Jess, tell me more how to do what you do. You've taught thousands of women how to be on a stage. And then we had people want to talk more about this work-life balance, especially as parents, especially as a new mom, how you juggle it all. So I'm going to today, you're just going to, I feel like I'm going to throw all the cards up in the air and see what happens because I'm going to ask you questions from each one of those buckets so that everybody gets their fill of Jess Ekstrom. Does that sound good? I love it. Let's do it. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Let's start with a skill. Tell me, why do you think everyone, everyone, not just people that want to be like you and be a TED talker and an author and on national television, when somebody that's just like, Hey, I'm in HR. I go to my building, my company two days a week. I work remote three days a week. Why should everyone practice public speaking and learn those skills? Yeah. So I remember, I don't think I've ever told this story before, but I remember when I was in college, uh, I took a a spin class and (laughs) this spin instructor, like, I felt like just, just went directly into my heart. And I remember she said to the class, she was like, okay, for this next set, I don't need you to give me everything. I just need you to do 1% more than what you did before, like 1% more. And I was like, Becky, I'll give you 2% more. Like I was so (laughs) in it. And after that, I like became a licensed spin instructor. I don't do it like much anymore. I can barely like ride an actual bike, but it was like my first time that I realized the gift of a microphone and doesn't matter the stage. It can be in a spin instructor class. It can be on a huge TED stage. It can be in an office. It can be at a family dinner. It can be at a friend's wedding. Just like the impact that you can have on people through your voice and the things that you say. And uh, I started to learn that like through Mm. teaching fitness classes. And I started to give tours on campus of like, Every single time I have the chance to stand up in front of people, I'm given a gift of helping change a little bit about themselves or change their day in somewhat shape or form, whether it's inspiring them, 
making them laugh, thinking differently. And you don't have to be an expert in order to do that. And so as I started, like long story, but as I started my Love speaking it. career, after I started my company, uh, you know, I, I realized how male dominated the, the speaking industry was, which, you know, mm -hmm. you and I have both seen that for our, ourselves yeah. and, uh, realized that a lot of women, I, and there's a lot behind that. There's a lot of like, you know, the people who are selecting speakers, the, I mean, just the gender hierarchy in general in our society, but a lot of times women weren't applying for the speaking spots because they thought like, well, I don't meet all the qualifications to be a speaker. I don't have some best-selling book. I don't have a million followers. How would I be able to speak on stage? Yeah. And so one of the things that I really stand by with Mic Drop Workshop and what I started as a result of that is like, you don't have to be an expert to be a speaker. In fact, there's a recent study at MIT around imposter syndrome, which I think is really interesting and in how it actually benefits you to have imposter syndrome. People who experienced feelings of feeling unqualified actually ranked higher at work because they're more student mindset, other focused, curious, uh, know that they have something to learn from everyone, don't believe that they are you know, the end all be all. And that's what it is being a speaker is you still have that student mindset, you're curious, but maybe you're 10% ahead on a topic, or maybe there's something that you can talk about unprompted for an hour. And so I like to believe that like, yeah, I teach you how to speak. I teach you if you want to become a paid speaker or just get better at speaking at work. But hopefully I make you believe that you have something to say, because that's the first step in all of this. I call it like, you know, you have your mind, you have your map and you have your moment. Like the mind is the internal work. The map is building what you want to say. And the moment is the delivery and the techniques that you do to engage an audience. But it, it has to start with the mind. And that's where I feel like a lot of people stop because of yeah. imposter syndrome, which I still have imposter syndrome <laughs> to this day. That never really stops. And it's interesting that you say that because a lot of people are asking like how to gain confidence in public speaking. And imposter syndrome is a little different, but I think it's important to talk about, you never get on stage like, I've got it, I know it all. You, there is always this tension, whether it's imposter syndrome or you're trying on a new skill, you're gaining confidence, you start doing stand-up comedy, right? And so you're like pulling in stand-up, I'm guessing into your uh, into your speaking events. And so it's not, we don't always know how everything's gonna go. Yeah, exactly. I like to say like every podcaster, like all of your favorite podcasters that you listen to once Googled how to start a podcast. So everyone had to start somewhere, but you know, I think sometimes it's like, there's a shift that you have to make when it comes to being a speaker, whether you want to speak better at work or speak better on stage, or if you're like, running for your kid's school PTA. And that I like to call it like the shift from being a spotlight speaker to being a lighthouse speaker. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like a spotlight is like, ta -da! like it is on me. This is my performance. I am here to tell you my story, you know, make myself look the best way as possible. Make sure that this show is about me. And it's really easy, quite frankly, to fall totally. into that mindset because you, from the outside, it looks like that's what speaking is, is like lights, camera, action. But when you shift from a spotlight speaker being very like internally, you know, uh, uh, like self-serving to being a lighthouse speaker where you're actually shifting the light from yourself out into the audience as more of a guide then you're actually speaking to say, okay, how can I best serve the audience? How can I best guide them through my story? So like an example would be a spotlight speaker would say, I'm here to tell you about like how I built my empire. But a lighthouse speaker would say, I'm going to show you how I built my empire. So that way you can build yours or that way you can learn from my mistakes or you can do the same thing. Yes. And I think that this helps a lot with nerves you know there's a lot of techniques that you know you can yeah. do around speaking like breathing techniques and and nervous system work 
But I think the biggest shift that we have to make is like how we think about speaking from being like spotlight self-serving to being lighthouse serving the audience. That's so good. That's so good because there really is a mindset that you are, when you, before you even step on a stage, you're setting yourself up. If you feel like I've got to get out there and really blow their minds. It's like, well, you're going to show up very differently than if you're coming out saying I'm here in service to you. You're choosing to sit there. That's humbling for me. No one's forcing you to be here. Like I think about, have you ever seen, or have you ever been tempted to go out on stage and be like, what's up, idiot? Excuse me, what? And then half the people scream, you're like, I can't hear you. Oh it's- my God, I can't do that. I can't. Oh, uh, it's, yes. Because who is that in it's service? It's so crazy. Of? Yeah, that's right. in service yeah. of, that's the speaker saying, I want a spotlight moment. They're really saying like, I need to know that you're cool with me. So I need everybody to tell me they're on my team before I have earned this space or shown you the value that I have. And it's one of the biggest mistakes I see. As soon as you get on stage, if you're asking the audience of something, you're being a spotlight. You're in the wrong zone. hundred percent. And it it sets the tone that's like, the, like eyes up here, you know? And I think even sometimes like, uh, the challenge as a speaker is to level the stage because when yes. you get up on stage, it already creates this imbalance of like looking up. And I would say like one of my jobs as a speaker is to like, how do I make it from this to this? Yeah. And so I always love suggesting opening in your introduction with a relatable story. I yes. love pulling from like childhood stories. I have the story of like, you know, selling my American Girl dolls on eBay or like getting published in Chicken Soup for the Soul when I was 12 and thinking I could retire. And like, just like, <laughs> how do I, you know, shed the like, oh, like I'm the speaker, the, the spotlight and change to the lighthouse. Because I think the other thing, and this kind of goes to like trying to make the speaking and the leadership space more equitable is like lessons resonate more when an audience member can like draw the bridge from where you're they're sitting to where you're standing. Yes. And if you're up there, like I've never made a mistake in my life. Everything I do is perfect. I'm a gazillionaire and I have no problems. Then the person in the audience is like, well, that's not me. So whatever they're saying, like doesn't apply to my life. Yep. But if I'm up there and I'm like, look, I'm a new mom. I am sleep deprived. I like th- I'm doing my best. I've built some businesses, but I've also made a ton of mistakes. And here's what I've learned. Then maybe someone in the audience can be like, actually, that's me. Like we're, we're walking similar paths. And so maybe I'm going to listen up a little bit because I can make the connection and I can make that leap. Um, but I think that also goes with like being able to identify with a speaker, yes. whether that's by like race, gender, color, like, you know, disability, everything. We just need more diversity on stages so people can see themselves in the people who are shifting opinions and starting conversations. That's so good. That's so good. And that you're right on it, you know, starting a keynote speech or even a meeting in your office with a little snippet of your childhood there's something about childhood and nostalgia. One of my speeches opens with talking about how my dad tucks would tuck me in every night and a little fairy would show up on my wall and predict my future. People are like, what? Now you already know that I'm close to my dad. I've already set the scene that I'm this little kid. So I'm a little bit more uh, accessible. You know, it's very interesting to see how even just showing parts of your own childhood help people feel connected to you. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, great, well, what does like the fairy on my wall have to do with like the people in the audience? You know, I like to do, uh, I I call it like a premise and a promise when you're speaking, like your premise is, is a story. Like what's the kind of the narrative of your life? If like someone was coming through with a camera and then the promise is the takeaway for the audience. So maybe you weren't a child that had a close relationship with your dad, or maybe you didn't have a fairy on your wall, or maybe you've never started a business like what I talked about, but I guarantee the lessons that I've learned in that premise, I can deliver a promise. 
Mm. I also like to call it like um, moment to meaning. And this is like an exercise you can kind of do throughout your day. It's great for journaling too. Mm -hmm. Is like, if you, and you can even do this right now, thinking about your day today, like imagine it was a film strip and you're just kind of rolling out your film strip and you just put your finger on like one frame. Maybe it was like walking into the office this morning, or maybe it was filling your coffee, or maybe it was like how you said goodbye to your spouse. That was a moment, like a moment in time. What was the meaning of it? Mm -hmm. And there's meaning in every moment, but a lot of times we don't take the time to see it. And so the stories, like the premise Mm -hmm. and the promise of our talk doesn't always have to be like, well, then I got on Shark Tank or then I did this big thing. It can be like, you know, dropping your kid off at school. And this is what I learned from it. And this is what you can learn about like letting go and letting people lead. So there's a lot of, of gold in the mundane, you know, like the, and, and it, it really does help create that relatable experience too, as a speaker. That's so good. Now I can imagine just like thinking about your life. If we put you in a room, I could, I think I could make a PowerPoint on your behalf and be like, Mr. Gopakino, Rafika, you do it. But I think part of that is your magic is you must have at least 20 stories, moments that you've plucked out of your life that have meaning, but that you could apply a few different ways. If somebody asked you a question, are you collecting? I can only imagine that you collect your stories and your moments to use in different scenarios? I literally, as we were talking, I, it, something, a story popped in my mind and I was like, this is perfect. And so I, I and I'll tell it to you because Please. I do feel like, but, and also in transparency, I did have a, a session with my therapist yesterday where I was like, I feel like because I think for a living, I need to also differentiate like, what are my thoughts that are being edited to share with a mass audience versus the thoughts that I just need to have for myself as being human. And so full transparency, I'm like working through that right now. So I like try to balance like what, how much of my life I Hmm. need to make matter to others and how much of it just matters to me. I'm even struggling with that with like parenting right now and like how much of that I want to share, you know, and, and how much of that is just between me and her. And so uh, Mm -hmm. all that to say whole other thing, but like a story that I had just thought of, uh, my husband and I, we did like an Airstream trailer trip around the country, um, a couple years ago. And we ended up going to this Island, like off of Portland, Maine. Um, that was really fun. I can't remember the name of it, but on this island that was like no cars, you know, uh, super small, there was this uh, museum for umbrella covers. You heard me correctly, a museum for umbrella covers. You can Google this right now. And I mean, this museum was probably the size of a, of a bathroom. And this woman just developed a passion for like unique umbrella covers and they were like organized by theme she had you sing a song when you're in there there was like a closet of like more erotic and r-rated umbrella covers and Mm -hmm. I was like what this woman got on NPR it's crazy and her whole thing is like I want to be the symbol for people to celebrate the mundane like pause and like look at the simple things in life that make you happy and it was just making me think of like the message that I share speakers is like your story doesn't have to be like a HBO series yes Yes. it can be something so relatable so normalized um in fact that's like what a lot of times that people need to hear so celebrate the ordinary and the mundane in your story, because a lot of people are walking that same path, but it made me think of the umbrella, (laughs) umbrella museum. And if you're ever at on that Island off of Portland, Maine, definitely go check it out. (laughs) We are taking a road trip. We're going on the road here. We're going to take the porch. That's what we're going to (laughs) do to the tiny umbrella museum, umbrella cover museum. Very narrow, very neat. Oh my gosh. Kristen in the chat just found it. So thank you, Kristen. (laughs) Kristen's on it. 
Oh, I should have known she would find it. That's fantastic. That's great. But that's, you know, it's interesting because that there's this false belief that you have to be on I have to be an Olympian or I have to have done something really amazing. And I think the other thing that I wonder how you manage this when you speak to, because this matters for leaders in business, you can't always share you as the hero of every story. Sometimes you have to be uh, like, this is how my, my band broke up because I didn't have great leadership skills. That's the truth. And the reason that, you know, after that happened, I thought I better learn how people work. And I went to coaching school. I'm not the hero in this story. I am just a character that's having an, an experience. And so sometimes I think you think, well, when I share a story, I need to show how I did it right, because I don't want my employees to think I'm a dummy or I don't know what I'm doing. How do you find the blend between when you share a story between you know, you kind of saving the day and you, yeah, something unfortunate happen or something that you couldn't expect or make a mistake. Such a golden question. And I feel like it's more important than ever because we live in a world of displaying our achievements and displaying our credentials, displaying our trophies, like, like, LinkedIn is like a breeding ground for imposter syndrome. Like every time I'm on there, I'm like, am I doing enough? Like, I, <laughs> yeah, you know, I know. What am I doing? Yeah. And so it's really hard to not like uh, go in, especially when you're given the privilege of like a microphone and say, here's why I deserve to be here. So yeah. what I like to tell people in Mic Drop Workshop is save your credentials for the introduction that someone else will read. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you, I always have like your, your prepped introduction that you can hand to the meeting planner and say like, introducing Lindsay, Lindsay has spoken at XYZ places. She's an amazing this, like you don't need to be the one to say that. However, I will say that I think that women should brag more. Like there's totally like space for that. If it makes sense in your message if that premise is also delivering a promise. Yes. Um, so don't be afraid to shine your accomplishments, but yeah. do it again in the name of the lighthouse and not the spotlight. So I yeah. like to say like, save those credentials for your written introduction. If you're speaking at work, trust that people will have context about you um, when when you're delivering that presentation or pieces of information. If you need to give them context, do so. But I I just think that I only want to give, like, for example, there is a part of my talk where I talk about some of the things that I have achieved. And the reason why I talk about some of the things that I achieved is because those were all the things like on my, like, if I can only get this, then I'll feel like I've amounted to something. And then I got those things and I still felt like crap and I still felt unfulfilled and I still felt like not qualified to be here. And I realized that I was confusing my achievements, those tangible milestones with my success, which is more of a um, internal work and feelings of legacy. And so learning to differentiate the two and how I can teach others to differentiate the two is my, is the the promise of that premise. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's hard. Uh, and especially as women, like, you know, you almost feel like you have to speak twice as loud or do twice as much in order to get the same opportunity. Yeah. Um, so I'm all for bragging, but when you're on stage, save it in the introduction that someone else will read or yeah. use it in a way that it's also teaching a lesson. That's smart. Yeah, that's really smart. And that's, you know, even somebody as famous as like Adam Levine from Rune 5, he used to say before yeah. I go- stage, I pretend that everybody out there loves me. I imagine that's some of his inner work. I imagine that everybody loves me. Yeah. going to receive me well, because so much energy, obviously, like I don't play for stadiums of 70,000 on a normal day. That's not really, but he's going out yeah. there for 60, 70,000 people. This idea of like, I imagine we're good. So if I walked in to yes. see, you know, somebody that I love that I knew loved me, I wouldn't have all this pepped up. Let me prove myself energy. And I wouldn't play small and and please like greet me, sing sing out of me. I just be like, Hey, what's up? And that type of attitude 
you know, that type of steadiness, it does take time to develop. And I'm so glad that you, I know you mentioned therapy, like on a whim, but this is the other piece. I go to therapy every week and this is like part of our, this is part of my own like emotional and psychological hygiene as I build a business, because that stuff builds up on my psyche, things that all different experiences build up. And it's so nice to have psychological support, especially when your business is your brain and your ideas and presenting them to other people. Totally. And I'll be honest that I am, I won't say late to the game, but like, it really was having my daughter that like kind of amplified a lot of this thinking. And it definitely started in, in postpartum depression, which I was like, I didn't realize that I was like, this is something that I, I wanted. How am I possibly depressed yes. right now? Yeah. And I just realized like the immense toll physically, mentally that motherhood has on women. Oh. And we just expect like, oh, six weeks later, like here, you know, <laughs> come on back or, or no, you can stay home. You just won't have a job or like anything like that. And, uh, and so this year has really been like a mental well-being first year yes. for me then I put more time and resources and attention towards that than I have ever before and I just have a whole new perspective on mental health for women for everyone and especially at work and and just trying to find your identity you know yep. again and and I do think like it has made me um you know there was definitely a if we're just speaking totally candidly, like there's was time that I was taking off because I had Ellie and I wanted to be really strict about that time. And so there was a lot of opportunities speaking that like I turned down and then you get in that mindset of like, well, what if I become irrelevant? You know, what if like, oh yeah. yeah, Like what if, what if no one ever comes knocking on my door again? Like, what if this is it for me? Totally. But what I've also like learned is that, um, kind of like the, the depths and the, and the lows that I experienced during postpartum, like added more color to the palette of how I'm perceiving life. And those moments and meanings are like Mm -hmm. just more intense than they ever have been. Um, so I like to say, like, I don't like to teach things when they're in the driver's seat with me. I like to teach them when they're in my rear view mirror. So like, I'm not there yet but I know that eventually this will become a part of my story, you know, that I share. Um, and, and also like just giving people permission, whoever's watching or listening, like there might be moments or things that are happening in your life, or there's something that happened, you know, with my family that I talk about in chasing the bright side, like being related to a like very high profile criminal that didn't, I wasn't comfortable talking about for 11 years. Um, So just because just because the message and like that, that promise isn't there right out of the gate, like doesn't mean that it's not shaping and also doesn't mean that it always has to be shared. Um, but know that it's coming, know that it's there and you can kind of like have faith in that. That's so good. Jess, that's so good because there is this piece of, um, there's like tender moments in our life, tender spots that it's not in our rear view mirror yet. It's sitting right next to me. I'm still in the middle of it, you know? And, um, a a few years ago, my partner and I put out a a podcast for LGBTQ folks. And then people started to ask me to speak on this. And I was like, I was happy as a clam with a microphone and speaking into nothingness and not having to worry about people's responses. But so it took me several years to say, okay, just this June, I was like, somebody asked me do, I get asked to do pride events. And I was, and I thought, I can do it this year. It's enough in my rear view. It took me three years of processing and therapy to be able to say, I'm not so tender and raw that I, you know, am self-focused. I can finally, now that I've moved through some of this, I have something to offer and it's okay if you don't like it or you think differently, or I don't need the audience to even agree with me now. But I think there's deep wisdom in saying, Hey, there's tender parts that I'm in work. I'm working with. And those don't come out on stage if I'm still in process, it's very wise. Yeah. Yeah. I like to, well, one, I think that that's awesome. That that's something that you're like, no, not, not there yet. Maybe I will be, maybe I won't be. 
Yeah. Um, but too, yeah, I like to say like, uh, you know, at Mic Drop Workshop, like, uh, like stage therapy is like not, not what is the best way to like process your problems. That's right. Um, work through it privately. Uh, and then if you want to, you can share them when it's in your rear view mirror, but you don't want to be like going through it at the same time as like the audience is listening. Um, because like I said, you want to have the insight you need to be able to deliver the promise and not just the premise of the experience. And sometimes that just takes longer to develop and that's fine. That's right. That's so freeing. I think that's really helpful for everybody to hear from you. Like the things that we're reading in your books or that you're sharing, these are things that consciously worked through to create space, to create some space, even from the event. So you can talk about it and deliver the meaning behind it. That's really yeah. And I want to go back to something that you said, Lindsay, yeah. uh, the, about like, like Adam Levine saying like yes. everyone, you know, everyone going out and everyone loves me. I think that's another like really great shift that you can make as a speaker, but I'll tell you like, uh, recently, um, you mentioned like stand up comedy that that's something that, uh, I've been like taking lessons and like doing some gigs on the side, but, um, it's funny how I was like, Oh, I could do stand up cause I'm a speaker. And then you get put in like a new environment and like everything that you know, and that you like even teach others just like goes out the window. Like I, I mean, I'm sure even like with music and speaking, like it's still a stage, but yet like, it's just a different setting or a different, different atmosphere. And so I would always tell people like, go out there as if the audience is on your side, like, and don't try to like prove you know, don't go up there trying to prove yourself, go up there as if you've already proven yourself. And this is what you have to say. When I did stand up, like it was like, I didn't do that. I I mean, it was, I was trying to go up there, win them over, like nail it. And I felt like afterwards, I was like, that just didn't feel good. Cause then you're also, when you do that, it's kind of like, going on a date, you, you start looking for cues. It's like, well, did they like that? Did they not? Were they that person who went to the bathroom? Was that, you know, you start like looking for cues and that's just exhausting. A lot of times wrong. Like you just can't decipher what people are thinking. Um, like one time I spoke at, uh, this like police, police training Academy, which was like, what? And, uh, literally like everyone in the audience, like when I spoke was just like this, even when I would make a joke, it was just like straight Uh face. And I was like, man, I'm like crashing and burning up in here. And after I got done, like I was expecting just like no one to come up and talk to me. (laughs) A line of these middle-aged men asking me to sign their books. And I I would say like, oh yeah, you want me to sign this for your like daughter or who do you want me to make it out to? And he's like, looks at his name tag. He's like, William, like, Oh, yeah, like what? And so, but if I had been up there and and tried to decipher what the audience like was feeling or thinking about me, I would have gotten it all wrong. Um, and so there's that. And then also know that it's like you might not be everyone's favorite person in the world, but yeah. and that's okay. Um, but that is like the hardest thing if you are a people pleaser. It's like Leslie Nope on Parks and Recreation where she like tries to win over that like one guy who said that (laughs) she's not someone that that she would go he would go bowling with and it's like (laughs) bowling campaign. And it's totally me. Yeah. I love it. I love it. That is it though. And I think it's so good too, Jess, like is to to know that when we even put ourselves in new environments, sometimes it doesn't, you don't nail it out the gate. Why would we? You know, I tried to do improv and the, I was the, there was eight of us and I was like, I'm going to nail this. I'm a public speaker. I have the opposite skill set as somebody in improv. So ever, I think like, you're ruining the scene. Boo, stop. But no, stop the scene. Lindsay, you just changed the action. You changed the moment. I'm like, did I? I thought I added to it. They're like, get out, start the scene. I was like, Michael Scott. I was Michael Scott in the yeah. office trying to do improv. So I think it's so helpful. Like we do try to create cross-disciplinary experiences for ourselves, but that also means we're sweaty, we're uncomfortable. It doesn't always go well. Those not 
those translate and it's so good for us. I mean, the oxymoron is like, just try to be good at being a beginner. I mean, yes. it's like anytime I'm just, I, I, one of the reasons why I was started doing stand up is because I've I'm been speaking for, you know, 10 plus years now. And I feel really confident in what I have to offer. I'm like, well, if I'm feeling good about this, no better time than to shake it up and <laughs> make sure that I'm like, still pushing myself and get humbled and stand up definitely humbled me. But I was going to say is like, when I did that gig where I went up there and I felt like I was trying to prove myself and I felt kind of like icky afterwards, there's other comic went up there and I could just feel that like he went up there knowing that like, I've already won, like, and I really don't care. And he nailed it. And it was just like, wow, he truly went up there with the mindset of like you all love me like what do I have to prove I'm just going to come out here and do my thing and it was really like oh wow I saw that in action and what that looks and feels like you know yeah it's a real shift it's like an energetic you're telling I like to think sometimes I tell folks you know humans we are predators and so if you walk up there as prey, like, is somebody going to eat me? We're going to eat you alive. And if somebody, and if you come up and you're like, yeah. I'm a lion too, what's up? People are like, right. Lion to lion. Like, understood. Got it. <laughs> you know, but it's exactly. not about being like cocky lion. It's about just like, like you said, you love me. We're here together. Let's do something fun. You really set the tone before a word comes out of your mouth. You set the tone. Energy. Yeah. And it's just more fun that way. Like, let's just, let's just have more fun. Life's, life's not that serious. Like, let's, let's just put it on easy mode every once in a while, laugh at ourselves. I love that. I love that. Okay. I have, so I'm sitting on like 30 questions, Jess. So what if, would you be down to do a lightning okay. round with me? Yeah, let's do it. I would love that. Okay. But I'm not responsible for what comes out of my mouth. Yeah. That's right. That's <laughs> right. This is editable. Even with our friends Perfect. with us. Okay, lightning round. I was going to say, no one here. Yeah. <laughs> and there's all, how many of us are there here? Yeah, all 24 of us, we will keep our mouths shut. Um, okay, yeah, let's yeah. see what comes, what comes to the service. Here's a lightning round. Scale of one to 10, how hard do you think it is to build a speaking business from the ground up? Mm. So is, I would this say, is tough. 10 is tough. Um, Honestly, I and I'm not just saying this, I would say like a three. Um, I don't think like the path from I want to be a speaker to like getting your fir- first paid gig is actually pretty short. And that's why I started my job workshop versus like, you know, we help people become authors too. I would say that's like a seven or an eight. There's a lot of things in between. Like I want to write a book and having that book out, but speaking that that path is pretty short. Um, so that's what I want to do is like release, like relieve Mm -hmm. people of the, like who, what, when, where, how, um, with mic drop workshop. Yeah. Brilliant. That's so good. What would be somebody comes to you and they say, I'm an HR director. I want to do a paid speaking gig. What's one step I can do today that'll help me get there. What would you say to that one step? What would you say it is? Put the word speaker in your bio, like any touch point that you have, your LinkedIn bio, your email signature, your business card, even if you haven't been paid or done it yet, like if speaking is what you want to do, you have to let people know you're a speaker. So this can take one minute of your time, add the word speaker to your bio. I love that. That's so good. And it's so simple. And it's just the beginning. Very simple. Yeah. Yes. You got to claim it. And it also is an energy shift. It's like, yeah, I am yeah. a speaker. I'm going to do this. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. Okay. Lightning round question number three. What's a boundary that you've brought into your life since having a kid that helps protect your mm-hmm. energy? Could be really simple. I, what do you think? Yeah. I removed the email app from my phone. And so it's only on my computer now, which has been amazing. Mm-hmm. And I'm slowly like doing that with other things like Slack is only on my my computer um, and a few other stuff that has helped so much. And life goes on if I'm not answering an email between the hours of like nine and four. Um, like it, it's just, 
the, I realized like that I don't have to be accessible all the time. Ooh, and in order for me to do what I do well, which is think for a living, I got to be able to think and I have to have that time off the removing Gmail and Slack and all those noisy things from my phone and just saving those for like working hours on my computer is helpful. No one, no one is paying you to go through emails while you're in bed at, at 7am. Just don't do it. Oh my gosh. That is good. I'm like, yeah, one second. I just got to do a couple things here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love it. Okay. Next question. What's something that you do almost as a ritual before you go on stage to set up your nervous system, whether there's five people, whether you're talking to an arena of 10,000, what's one thing yeah. that you find yourself doing to help set up, set yourself up for success? So to get like control of my nerves, um, I do box breathing. So I don't know if any of you have done that before, but it's like breathe in for four seconds, hold at the top for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, hold at the bottom. And this just helps you get in control of your breath, which really reminds you that it's like, oh yeah, this is me. Like I am in control of this. This situation is not in control of me. So box breathing has been really helpful as like an actual physical nervous system reset. But as far as mental um, one of the things I always like to tell myself is the pressure is a privilege. And so I have kind of like a little mantra that I, that I remind myself of, whether it's like, anytime I'm doing something big, I'm like, man, this, the pressure is a privilege. And, uh, anytime that I get the chance to like have a mic, whether it's to two people or 2000, what a privilege that is. And, um, again, that helps me shift from the spotlight to the, the lighthouse. That's so good. And then one thing that you do after a talk, because sometimes you, you, you may think that Jess just walks off a stage and is like, well, going to go make a sandwich, going to go hang out with my family, but it's <laughs> a little more complicated. You're at this elevated performance state of being, and then you're coming yeah. back down. Yeah. What's something that helps yeah. your body say, like, it's time to cross over. It's time to come back down and relax. Oh, that's so good. I'm curious what yours is actually, because I'm working on this, not just with talk, but with like life transitions from like yes. work and it's like okay Jess you are safe you can just be here right now um okay one thing that I will say that I do that isn't in the name of switching to relaxation but and after I speak I always ask the event planner uh who do you have like what other speaker needs do you have are you looking for other speakers mm -hmm. because in the name of like equitable speaking and 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 trying to get more women and like people of color on stages that's the easiest and best way you could do it is right after you speak what are your next events let me t send you five women's names that i think would be perfect for that so that's like a ritual that i do that i is also really helpful to the event planner yes. um but i will say like i give myself permission to like veg out my guilty pleasure whenever i'm on the road is uh, I call ahead and see if the the hotel has a microwave in my room and I get air pop popcorn and a box of raisinets and I pop the popcorn, dump the raisinets in the popcorn so they get a little bit melty with the chocolate and it mixes. Chef's kiss right. and watch like some kind of trashy TV. Yeah. <laughs> I'm writing this down. I'm like popcorn, raisinets, yeah. trashy TV. This is Got really it. key. Yeah, yeah, very key. <laughs> Got it. Walk away with anything, it be that. This is our best speaking tip. Have you ever sort of melted yes. a resonant? This exactly. Is it's a game changer. That's so good. That's so good. It's just nice to know, like, it's, it's, you're not really on part of the magic of being a performer at your level is you also have to know on the equal side, how to come all the way down. So it's not just right. buzzing up here. When we see you in public, when we see you on stage, you are at that max level performance, but you have many moments where you're at the, where you're just letting everything come down and you're unplugging and that rhythm yes. is part of how speakers make it long-term. That's the reason you've been out for more than a decade. You'll be speaking as long as you want to, because you're learning this pacing, yeah. it's almost sine wave. I'll tell you, yes, exactly. And I'll tell you, uh, one of my friends, Antonio Neves, he's also a great speaker. Um, kind of gave me a cautionary tale one time when I was kind of on my way up with speaking that I think about all the time. And he's very, uh, he writes about this in his book. So he's very transparent, but 
uh, you know, he was speaking a lot and he would come home and his wife and kids, you know, were there and he would just need a day or two to compress and just like, yes. you know, didn't want to be in front of everyone. And one day she goes, I wish you gave us half the energy that you give to strangers. And I was like, dang. Oops. And he, he realized he was like, my energy is being like all in the performance of speaking and I'm not saving it for the people who I care about the most. And yes. so like recognizing like where your energy distribution is and taking that time, like when, if you are on the road speaking or whatever, like I'm going to recoup that night that way, when I am home tomorrow, I'm back. I don't need like two days for you to like, not talk to me or for, you know, to not, I, I want to make sure that when I'm home, I'm home instead of like, oh, I can't possibly, you know, be bothered with it or whatever it might be. And so it is, I think that, you know, rest is a right, not a reward, but I also want to make sure that I'm distributing my energy in the most deserving places and not sacrificing it for strangers when my family needs it mm -hmm. too, you know? Yes, that's it. And I think that's the piece. Somebody asked this question. It was really good. Um, how to keep my, com how do I keep my composure in the midst of work life? And part of what I hear you saying is this, there's an energy management, especially maybe being a speaker when you're on the road and you're kind of managing all different parts of your life, but consciously thinking ahead and saying, how much energy will I need for this? How much energy will I need for this? I need to pace myself. And that's part of how you keep composure. I could imagine is by pacing out yeah. and kind of looking ahead for the next few days. You know, I think that, and I'm curious if you like agree with this, I, I, I developed this theory uh, now that I'm in my thirties and I felt like in my twenties, there was this like, yes, yes movement of like, I need to say yes to everything because it's how I'm going to grow and it's how I'm going yeah. to expand and it's how I'm going to have these collision points with people that I might never have before. Like, sure, I'm going to come to this conference. Yes, I'm going to do this thing. And then all of a sudden, um, there's like a shift in your life and in your career where like the being the yes person isn't serving you anymore. Right. And all of a sudden, my default now, and this sounds maybe negative or pessimistic, but my default is no. Yes. And it has to be like a, oh, yeah, this is like absolutely perfect for me. And it aligns with what I want to do. It aligns with my 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 value, my schedule, like all of it. Um, and that's okay. But there's like a guilt that happens when you're in that kind of puberty phase of coming yeah. out of your yes phase and into your no. And you're just like, wait, but I'm the cool person that's supposed to show up at every party. And now yes. you're like, no, I am preserving my energy. I am, I am keeping it, whether that's you travel a lot for work or whether that means that you, maybe it's like going out for drinks with friends after work used to be something you do all the time. And now you're like, no, I want to go walk my dog and like cook yep. dinner or whatever it might be. It's okay to enter your no era when you had a yes era and who knows, maybe it'll come back, but give yourself that permission to do that. That is so good. That is so good there. Have you heard of um, Greg McEwen? He wrote this book called essentialism. Yes. We, we spoke at a uh, catalyst university together and he was awesome. That book is incredible. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So in that book, he talks about how your shift in from yes to no has to happen or else your performance plateaus. And so if you keep saying yes to everything, you basically dilute your power. So essentialism is like, what's the one thing you're going to do? Well, what's the one thing you're going to do? Well, and even thinking about like, I bet Beyonce says no to 99.9% .9 of her opportunities. Right. I bet speaking of like eras, I bet Taylor Swift says no to literally. Oh my gosh, how does she do everything. it? Yeah, she, she has to say no to everything in order to put on that kind of performance. I'll yes. also plug our now mutual friend, Kate Rose now, who I introduced you yes. to. And she's like, like a system strategist. She's amazing. But she tells me this, or she has said this, and I like want to tattoo it on my forehead. But the best use of your time is doing the thing that you do best. And so I always like ask myself that is like, is this the best use of my time is going in and toggling and editing this Canva graphic that I am an awful aesthetic designer person. No, I could probably outsource that and, and be writing or speaking or doing whatever it is. 
So the best use of your time is doing the thing that you do best. That's and so good. Like kind of auditing your week with yeah. that lens in mind is really helpful in like, is, is this, should I be doing this or should I find a way to outsource? Yes, that is brilliant. And that is, that's how you end up getting to a level where you get to breathe, have balance and have the life that you want is it's kind of scary to start saying, no, it's a scary yeah. transition, but if you don't do it, you'll be tied up in all these little other issues. You're not even good at solving, which sounds like my personal. Yeah. And I, right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and Jake and I have, my husband and I have talked about this. It's like, you know, we're both entrepreneurs. Like we work together on the business and no matter how good things are, you just feel like, oh my gosh, is the shoe about to drop? You know, wh what's mm -hmm. going to happen? I know you feel that. And um, so I'm like, okay, well, should you like go do something else or whatever? And, and, and whenever we talk about that, we always kind of go through like, well, what is our, like our, our currency as a family and our currency, yes. like our most prized possession is free, but freedom and flexibility. Um, and so sometimes we're willing to sacrifice like monetary and dollar amounts in order to keep that freedom and flexibility. Not everyone is that way, but I think when you can decide like, what is my like success currency for myself? What is my success currency for my family? It, it, it kind of removes the pressure of like having to win at all the currencies. Oh, you so probably good. Not. You know, you're not going to hit every single bucket. So what's the bucket that matters the most to you? And just kind of rid yourself of the need to hit every and maximize every single bucket. Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's gold. Yes. Well, I know I've, we've gone through a lot of questions. Thank you for playing my lightning round. Oh, with me. yeah. <laughs> and we only have I a few it. minutes. Yes. I know we only have a few minutes with you left, but I'm so curious. Will you tell us more about Mic Drop Workshop and how it works? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, it started, uh, actually the funny story of how it started was, you know, I realized how few women speakers there were. So I yeah. rented out like the bottom of a restaurant here in Raleigh and put up like an event, right? For $20. I was like, anyone who wants to, any woman who wants to come learn about public speaking, like come to this restaurant on Thursday night and I'll put together like a how to, yes. and it was like totally packed. And someone was like, you know, can you put this online or I don't live in Raleigh. Can you send this to me? And so then that turned into like, let me, you know, record something, put it out there. And now Mic Drop Workshop is an online course and community that's trained thousands of women to become professional speakers. Um, so I know that, uh, that you can share the link, you know, with people as well, but um, I would also say something that we're expanding into this year is we've had a lot of people that come to us that say, you know, I want to be a professional speaker, but we have a whole other community of women that are coming to us that say, I don't need to have a keynote talk. I have no interest in like being a professional speaker. However, I want to get more confident at speaking at work or in my life or in my job, you know, whether I give a presentation or storytelling or leading a team meeting, I just want to get more comfortable, like being, you know, in that, that center of attention. And so uh, we're putting together uh, a new curriculum called Mic Drop Workforce, where we work with companies to help mm. their like entry to mid-level women become more effective communicators and presenters. So if that's something of interest to you, please reach out to me because uh, we're putting it together now and I'm looking for, for feedback and anyone that'll talk to me about it. <laughs> that's fantastic. It's yeah. so exciting to think about this, you know, being a strong communicator is so powerful, being able to hold people's attention and tell people what you mean to say and being a strong communicator. I mean, you have so much that you are bringing, not just to somebody who wants to do a TED talk, but if you have a board meeting next week, if you lead Girl Scouts in your city, whatever it is, there's an opportunity to grow as a, as a speaker and a communicator and to get your voice heard. That's awesome. Totally. Yeah. And, and it can, like you said, it doesn't have to be, I, I, sometimes I hesitate, like even saying the word speaking is daunting. I, I think we were talking yeah. about it before. Like it feels like, well, I'm not going to give a Ted talk, but it's like, well, what if you wanted to put up a traffic sign in your neighborhood because you felt like it was unsafe and you had to go to city hall and you had to like protest for this traffic sign. 
wouldn't you want to have the tools where you could go up there and give the best like foot forward and your best compelling presentation about a traffic sign? So no matter what it is, like speaking it plays a role in everyone's life. And I truly believe like on the other side of an impactful talk is opportunity, whether it's opportunity in your career, opportunity for your business, opportunity for like a cause or something that you want to advocate for or care about, um, or even just in your relationships, like being able to articulate what you want to say with like, with influence. Um, it, it, it's a skill that will never be wasted. And I just want to help more women have that skill in their tool belt. That is fantastic. That's great. I'm so excited to see who signs up. I know Sam just put the link in the chat. So if you want to learn more, check it out. Jess is on almost every single social media platform. I love watching her on TikTok. That's one of my faves. But LinkedIn, if you want to keep track of her on Instagram, there's so many places to continue to hear nuggets of wisdom from her. And there's an opportunity to go through a workshop. I've actually met several people that have gone through it. Uh, through her workshop, just yes, so we have a few of them here. I'm looking at them. Yeah. Jess Rodriguez is here. Renee, I know you're fine. You're coming in this fall. Like, yeah, there's a, a lot of you here. So thanks for being here. Also, can I tell people one more way that uh, they can get in touch with me? Oh, please. Um, so I, I send out I send out a hype text every Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern, yep. and so you can text me the word hype to 704-228-9495, and I actually read those texts. There we go. Yeah, 704-228-9495. Um, and it's not like a robot. It's actually me. So if you have anything you want to ask or say, feel free to shoot me a text. Yeah. That is so exciting here. I'm going to put this on my text. Mm, 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 mm. Do they need to put something in that text, Jess? What do they say? Uh, you can put the word hype or you can just say, hey, Jess, whatever you want to say. Uh, okay, awesome. But yeah, that's perfect. You've oh, got Andy, you've hype. been receiving the hype text since... 2020. You're the best. Thank you. I think that's when I started. So you're an OG. <laughs> an OG right here. Fantastic. Well, Jess, thank you so much for your time. I know that you dropped so much wisdom and just insight perspective on what it actually means to be a speaker. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Can't wait to see thank how you for everybody engages with I, you after. Again, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate your just like alliance and your friendship over the past couple months. Um, you have been a real inspiration to me of just like walking the walk and I can't wait to see what more we do together. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Everybody's uh, shouting you out in the chat. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you yeah. the advice. Love this. So practical and insightful. Yes. Jess is awesome at that. Love it. Great. Well, y'all know how to stay in contact with Jess. Thank you for your time, Jess. And we'll see you again on the porch, everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, team. See y'all. Bye.